Karen Andrews, welcome to the program. Can I just start by asking whether you agree with your colleague Andrew Lamming there? Should the heads of the NBN, Snowy Hydro, Australia Post and so on, earn multiple times what a high court judge earns? Look, there has been extensive debate on remuneration for senior uh, public service uh, officials, heads of statutory authorities. Uh, that has been going on for many, many years. We do have a remuneration tribunal that deals with many of those issues. But the core of the issue, particularly with where we are at the moment, is that uh, we have seen over the last couple of days in particular where there have been instances of things that have happened that have not gone anywhere near passing the, the pub mm -hmm. test. So we've got taxation advice and, of course, we've got the issues with Australia Post. Now, I don't think Australians generally have an issue with people being remunerated appropriately. What they do have an issue with is that being taken advantage of. So if you are uh, earning a significant salary, then maybe you can pay for your own hair and makeup. Maybe you can do um, the pretty basic things that everyday Australians do to, uh, to look after yourself and not constantly look to how you're going to up your remuneration by cashing in on the public purse. But the remuneration itself, just to be clear, you don't have a problem with some of the salaries these uh, CEOs are earning? Well, I think that uh, what we've got to look at is a couple of issues. And yes, we do want to attract the best and the brightest into the, the public sector. I mean, that's a very important thing for us to look at. But they do need to be remunerated appropriately. And that is not mm. paying them over the top. And it's not then looking at ways to supplement um, their base salary. OK. What about the idea of a wider inquiry, though, as to how they're spending money on? I mean, you mentioned some of the items there on hair and makeup and so on. Does there need to be a wider inquiry across these public uh, entities? I think the first step is to start with uh, Australia Post and to discover whether or not this was a, a one-off issue or whether it is uh, systemic and understand what the breadth of those issues actually are. And from there we can see, well, are there, there wider issues that we need to look at across the public sector? Well, that wouldn't tell you what's going on at the NBN or the Future Fund or anything, would it? A four-week inquiry at Australia Post? Uh, no, but it's going to give you an insight into what is happening in that one organisation. That's the first step. Okay. So I think we need to understand what's happening there and then look potentially more broadly, but only um, on the basis of, of, of what we actually find at, at Australia Post and potentially at, at ASIC. Now, uh, let's turn to your portfolio. In a few, it's a few weeks now since you unveiled the manufacturing uh, plan, uh, $1.5 billion to be mm. spent on six chosen sectors. Can you explain how decisions will be made on which businesses will benefit in which electorates? Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're doing is establishing task forces in each of the six priority areas that have been established under the modern manufacturing strategy. So those task forces will look at what the opportunities are within each of those areas, whether that be in food and beverage, whether it be in medical products, whether it be in defence, etc. So they'll look at what the key priorities are there. Their work is going to feed into the program guidelines. Now there is an expanded role for ISA, the Innovation Science Australia Board, which is going to um, have a greater industry focus and will actually become Industry Innovation and Science Australia. So they will oversee the development of those guidelines. It would then go through a, uh, a process of opening up grant funding for that. The assessment, we'll still work, we're still working through how that is going to be undertaken because this is probably the equivalent of a tender analysis this time. So it's not a simple um, grant uh, well, this is what I, I want to come process. to, because if you've got a winemaker yep. in, in WA and a winemaker in South Australia, they both want to upscale. They both want to take their product to the world and they come knocking on your door for a grant. Just in simple terms, who decides mm -hmm. who gets the money? Uh, so it will be uh, ultimately through the department and myself as the uh, minister responsible, but I will be taking advice from 
Industry Innovation Science Australia and also the CSIRO. So there will be a proper evaluation done. The advice that will come to me will be more than whether or not we're just going to accept the advice that's being put to us. We will be doing our own due diligence so that we're verifying that um, that what is being put to us is realistic and achievable. OK, but just uh, you know, with all due respect, there's been a lot of cynicism around politicians having anything to do with grant mm -hmm. funding recently. Can you give us an assurance mm -hmm that this will be done at arm's length, that you as a minister and a politician won't be allocating this funding? Mm -hmm. I have been very clear that we need to make sure that we get the proper advice for those um, decisions. Now, those decisions will come to uh, to me, but they will be based on the advice of a um, an advisory board, which is ISA, but with significant input from CSIRO. Okay. Now, you, you've, of course, announced this as part of a budget to help get us out of recession. How much of this $1.5 billion will be spent, though, in the first year? Uh, overall, it's going to be about $40 million that will be uh, spent before the end of this current financial year, um, and then there will be progressive rollouts of, of that. So before the end of this year, we'll be opening uh, funding for the second round of the uh, Manufacturing Modernisation uh, Fund. So that will be open and assessment will be made as soon as uh, we possibly can with a view to that money so going only, out. Just to be clear, uh, only $40 million this financial year will be spent. So the bulk of this, the vast bulk of this will be hopefully when we're out of recession. Uh, well, I think you've got to put this into the perspective that uh, the most significant uh, funding program that is part of this strategy is the collaboration stream. Now, that is worth around about $800 million, but the expectation is that there will probably only be around 10 projects that are supported. So this is, you know, $70 to $80 million of government funding going into building the scale that we need mm. in our key manufacturing uh, sectors. That is actually going to take time to make sure that we get it right and I'm not going to be pushed into making a quick decision without that due diligence being done. And that's important but there are a lot of manufacturers who probably would like some support right now. I mean just this week uh, two big global pharmaceutical companies Pfizer and GSK, GSK announced they're shutting down manufacturing plants in Australia. Mm -hmm. The Pfizer plant in Perth, the GSK mm -hmm. plant in Melbourne, several hundreds uh, of jobs will be lost in each. Mm -hmm. Isn't this the sort of manufacturing mm -hmm. you should be trying to support right now? Well, let me go back a step because there's already a lot of support that is um, is able to flow and is already flowing to um, all industry, but specifically into to manufacturing. So there's money uh, in skills, close to $7 billion is being uh, rolled out. There's the instant... Why, why are these two shutting down then, do you think? These two pharmaceutical manufacturers, why are they shutting down plants? So those decisions uh, were made based on uh, global decisions by those uh, those businesses, and look and that it's not worth doing doubt, business it in is Australia. Disappointing. Uh, no, there's been a realignment of what the priorities are going to be, and let's be clear that. Um, Manufacturing is not immune from the shocks that have happened around the world with uh, with COVID-19. So we're going to see that there's some impact. So it's not going to be plain sailing uh, from here. It is going to be a bumpy ride. Now, yes, Pfizer and GSK are making some changes. And yes, I would love nothing more than for them to be staying here. But the reality is those decisions were made globally. I'm very much focused on the, the future. Medical products is a key priority uh, for us. And we have had many approaches from industry that are looking to establish or to ramp up, scale up their well, again, facilities again, here in Australia. Sorry to interrupt, Minister, but if, if it is such a priority, medical uh, technology and manufacturing, why can't you get more mm -hmm. of this $1.5 billion out the door right now to keep these plants going, to keep mm -hmm. this pharmaceutical manufacturing in Australia, to keep these jobs when we're in the depths of a recession? Mm -hmm. Well, there is money, as I've said, that is already uh, flowing, and you can't separate out all of the money and say, "Well, this is only the manufacture. This is only what's allocated to manufacturing," because it builds on the very strong base. Now, um, Greg Hunter's, the health minister and the prime minister, have made some significant amounts of um, money, uh, made announcements about significant um, amounts of money that will go to support uh, the manufacture of a vaccine here in Australia. So that sort of work is already happening. 
providing support is going to uh, the likes of CSL. Uh, support went to many businesses uh, during the height of COVID, particularly uh, the likes of ResMed. We had grey innovations that were supported to look at um, developing and producing ventilators here in Australia. So that money is already flowing and has flowed. So this is the, the money that I'm talking about with the $40 million. That needs to go through a proper process because I'm not going to um, to set something up that's likely to be criticised because it was done on the, the, the run and money was just dispersed All in right, a well, just willy nilly manner. On the vaccines, uh, as you mentioned, the, the idea is if a vaccine's proven safe and effective, it'll be manufactured at CSL in Australia and rolled out uh, here that way. Um, there are some concerns, though, about whether CSL does have the, the, the skills, the equipment, the, the super cooling and so on that might be necessary for a, a quick run production line of a new vaccine, a new um, novel coronavirus mm -hmm. vaccine. I mean, can you give us an assurance that, that that capacity is there, the skills and the equipment to make this happen? Mm -hmm. So um, I was um, asking very similar questions myself, um, David, when we were discussing this. So what I did to assure myself of um, CSL's capability was I involved CSIRO and I got them to send um, their senior technical people into CSL to work with CSL to determine whether or not the capability was there. Now, in fairness, some of that capability is, is going to have to be uh, developed. Oh, look, uh, CSL is an outstanding organisation and yes, we need to look at what support we give them and we have already agreed to give support to them so that they can ramp up their um, capability. OK, but they what did CSIRO the tell you upgrades. after they went in and had a look? I'm just, the answer here is, can they do it? Uh, uh, CSIRO advised me that they were confident that CSL would be able to get itself into a position where it could uh, deliver, which means that it has to look at the technical upgrades, but that work is and already And how long will underway. that take? Is that months away or, I mean, how, what sort of time frame are we looking at? Well, we're obviously going to work on that as quickly as um, as we can. So I would think that... Um, so well, you don't know right is, now, if, know a vaccine is found, if a vaccine is found this year, how quickly uh, until they can produce it and roll it out? We will do everything that we can to make sure that that happens. Now, understanding that CSL is already producing our vaccines. So if what is approved is a protein-based uh, vaccine, CSL will be at a position to start manufacturing that straight away. So there's no issue mm. at all with but that. But if it's not the protein-based... The issue based... that comes into... Uh, we're actually doing quite separate work. We have conducted an audit of what our manufacturing facilities are that could be used, whether we would need to look at a, uh, a new site to be able to uh, produce that, particularly if it's an mRNA-based uh, vaccine. We would need to do a lot of work, as would the rest of the world. Yeah. But what well, I what's can a lot of work? You, is that, is and, that a year? Assure... Or, I mean, are we talking... I'm just trying to get a time frame here because everyone's sweating on this vaccine. Would it take six yeah, months or a year to get the production line up and running? Well, if we're talking about a protein vaccine, it's there now. Sure. If it's an mRNA, then that's going to take significantly longer to be able to do, but the work is, is a underway. Year? A year? Is that what we're talking about? I would hope that we would be able to do it um, in about the nine-month to 12 month uh, time frame, but I think we need to be really conscious that with a vaccine, there are a lot of variables in there. Um, so we don't have the vaccine proven at this point in time. We don't know what the base for that vaccine is going to be. No. So we're trying to prepare across a wide uh, range. And I know, David, that you want me to say categorically, this is what the time frame is going to be. But I don't believe that there is anyone that can answer that question. No, I appreciate the that. There's that a lot of doubts do. around it. But I, yeah. I do appreciate you giving some yeah. time frame there about nine to 12 months based on the type mm. of vaccine it is. Finally, the Queensland election coming up Saturday. Uh, the LNP mm -hmm. uh, has this week announced a plan for a curfew for children uh, only in the state's north. Mm -hmm. uh, parents will be fined if their mm -hmm. kids are out after 8pm. Are you worried this is going to particularly target Indigenous kids or are you comfortable with this? 
Look, I think that there is an issue in, in North Queensland. I actually grew up in Townsville um, myself. There is um, an issue, and that's what Deb Frecklington, as the leader, was was trying to address. Now, I think that um, that, that most parents would, would say that if your child's um, uh, out on the streets after 8 o'clock at, at night, they should be supervised, particularly if they're under um, 14. So I think that it is, um, it, it, it's a, a significant proposal that Deb Frecklington has um, announced. It is an election commitment. She's taking... I think that um, kids under 14 should be uh, well supervised at night when they're, when they're out. Do you Absolutely. support the curfew? Do I support? Uh, look, yeah, I understand once again you're trying to pin me um, down on that and I'm, well, I'm just, absolutely I'm just you supportive. Question. You do support the policy? Yep, and I just, yeah, I just said I'm absolutely okay. supportive. Terrific uh, Industry Minister Karen Andrews, thanks very much for joining us this morning. Take care.